congregational hymn is number 93, followed by a scripture reading, Deacon Allen Dustin Sr. God 
bless all of you that are visiting and watching from the First Baptist Church of Dean Wood. Thank you. Amen. 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 Good morning, church. Just a few announcements and we'll take our seat. Our next church conference will be held this Saturday, uh, March the 25th at 12 noon with the option to attend in person or Zoom or conference call. Please contact the church office no later than this coming Thursday, the 23rd, to register and to designate your method of attendance. Please join us on Sunday, March 26th, a week from today, for our water baptism service. That service will start at 9.30 a.m. Please join us on our Palm Sunday service on April the 2nd at 10.30 a.m. In observance of Palm Sunday, for those who are attending uh, morning service, or to those that are not attending morning service, uh, uh, you can pick up your palms and your communion sacraments at 11.30, from 11.30 to 12 o'clock noon here at the West Door. Please join us on March Thursday, uh, April the 6th, in the last seven sayings and last seven cries of Jesus on Good Friday, given by our ministers here at First Baptist. Uh, that service will start at 7.15 on Thursday and 7.15, Monday Thursday, 7.15 on Good Friday. Please utilize uh, bread and juice items that you may have at home to, rep to represent the communion sacraments. To assess these services by conference call, please use the Sunday School dial-in number for information. Or contact the church office or ch check the church's website or Facebook page for additional information. Please join the Sunday Church School on Sunday, April the 9th as a Resurrection Sunday at 9 o'clock for their Resurrection Sunday presentation. Come grow with us. Come grow with us here at the First Baptist Church of Deanwood, whether you're looking for a church home, to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, either by Christian experience or water baptism or rededication, or by letter or watch care, even read this statement. We would love to have you as part of our church family. Just a reminder, just a reminder, we will continue to wear a mask of our temperature checks. If you do not have a mask, one will be provided for you, either at the vestibule or at the west door, so that we can continue uh, in an environment of safety. At this time, we're going to ask that the uh, Reverend Paul Miller Lester to come to the podium. Amen. 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 Reverend Paul, on behalf of your church family, we'd like to present to you the token of love for this year, last week, uh, the fifth anniversary as Amen. minister. Of our Amen. May God continue to bless your ministry, bless your family as you go forward. Thank you so much.
What can we say, God, but thank you, Lord God. Thank you for life is Sunday. Thank you, Lord God, for the cross. Thank you, Lord God, for resurrection. Thank you for salvation. In the precious name is above every sin name. That name is Jesus. Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, Lord God. In his name we pray. And God's people say, Amen. It's prayer time. Prayer time in the life of the church. Mark, the 11th chapter, says that Jesus was talking. If you pray, if you pray believing, you will receive. He said something about the mountain. You tell the mountain to move, and you believe that mountain will move. So prayer is an adventure. Prayer is an opportunity to converse with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? Amen. As Deacon called Stevenson, and come to us, we ask that you pray for him. Pray for his family. Pray for this church. Pray for our projects of this church. Pray for this city. Pray for this country. Pray, church. Pray. Let us pray. Abba, Abba, our Father, it is in the precious name of Jesus that we come this brisk and bright sunny morning. Thanking you for your Son, thanking you for the Holy Spirit, thanking you for allowing us to be here one more time. Heavenly Father, we confess and recognize that you are sovereign. You are God all by yourself. I must confess, we have a preacher in the pulpit and a pastor on the way. Yet I'm a little nervous. I have to not lean on my understanding but the trust that you will deliver us a past. We've been down this road before. Since Reverend Allen has been over 40 years, and like the Israelites, we've been around this road over 40 years. Yet, we trust in you, O oh Lord. Thanking you for who's on the way. Prepare us, O oh Lord that we might be ready to receive the next pastor of the First Baptist Church of Being. It may take some work, but we know you can work it out. Work us out, O oh Lord. Prepare us, O oh Lord, in the precious name of Jesus. Now that we receive the word from Reverend Dr. Paul, help us to hear the message understand the message and get an understanding of what you have us to do. Again, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.
many can share that declaration? How many can share just because he's God? How many can say for all he's done for me? Redeem and set me free. And because, just because he's God. I tell you, it's something the more you just reflect on the goodness of God. No matter what your situation is in the midst of anything, when you turn your thoughts away from focusing on your situation and just look up to the hills and say, because, just because, he's God. Oh, I just love it so much. Deacon Beatty and the Board of Deacons Ministry, um, thank you so very much. It would have been my desire to have actually been there, been here last Sunday. Um, that was my plan, but you know, God will sometimes allow things for his reasons, and my job was not to question why he allowed it, but just to say thank you, Lord, in the midst of it, and trust that this too shall pass. And I can guarantee you, when you just put everything into the hands of the Lord and say, you know what, you got this, I will just humble myself and just let it be what it's going to be. God has a way of not just bringing you out of it, but giving you a more intense praise even in the midst of everything. And I, I got to tell you, I hope you don't mind me sharing, but when God just allows you to have to sit down for a moment, it really does give you a greater appreciation of how good it feels to feel good. And it gives you a greater appreciation of those who truly are suffering with an illness because it allows you to see that in God's mercy, he just had you there for just a few seconds according to his calendar, according to his clock, and how dare you complain for a few days' discomfort when there are folk that are really having to deal with things on an ongoing basis. What I'm trying to say is, if you were tempted to have a pity party in the midst of a temporary situation, you need to shut that party down, turn it around and have a praise party and say, thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. And no, that's not the message this morning, but it's just something that was placed on my heart. And I do want to thank um, everybody for reaching out for your prayers. God truly hears and answers prayer. And I am just standing here just so grateful, so strong, and so excited in anticipation for the word that the Lord has provided. When he gave it to me, I must confess, I was a little bit, um, I won't say nervous, but I was a little concerned because I hadn't heard from him regarding the word for this morning. And I'm used to him just making sure that I get enough time so that I can, I can understand. But when God really wants you to know it's not about you, it's about me, he will let you know what to say on his timetable. And the moment you decide that, well, you know what, I haven't heard from God, so I'm going to put something together, that's the moment nobody, including you, is going to be blessed. So I am very grateful that I was blessed by the word this morning. And if you pray with me and pray for me by the power of the living God, I believe you too will be blessed. So the message this morning is coming from the second epistle of Peter. It's in the New Testament, young people, toward the back. If you're using your Bible apps, you know that we use the King James Version. It's the very first chapter. I'll be reading for your hearing verses 1 through 4. And it reads, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, 
according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And the tag on this message is, it's in the book. It's in the book. Let us pray. Dear Father, thanking you again for this beautiful day. Thanking you, Father, for all the things that you have done for us, the things you are doing for us, and the things you will do for us. Father, now that it is preaching time, I do ask that you hide me behind the cross and let it be your word that comes forth with power and authority with which you ordained it. I ask and add this prayer to the prayer that the deacon lifted up, that your people will hear your word, your people will understand your word, your people will receive your word, and thank you for strengthening our faith muscles that we will joyfully and cheerfully be obedient to your word. This prayer is offered in the matchless name of the one and only Christ, Jesus the Messiah, we pray. Amen. It's in the book. You know, there's a story that's told about a young man who was a freshman in college, and he had money that had been put in for him, you know, his parents put into an account for him to be able to meet all of his needs. But as the year progressed, he found that his money started to dwindle. So he sent an email over to his dad and said, hey dad, everything's going great, grades are looking good, but I'm running low on funds. Could you please send some money? And he checked his email, finally he sees a response that says everything you need is in the book. Yes. So he goes through and he said, okay, Pops might have been napping when I sent him the message. Let me give him a couple of moments and let me email again. Maybe my message wasn't clear enough. So he gave him a little bit of time and the money's still dwindling. So he sends another email. Hey, Pops, I love you so much. Things are still going well. But I'm really running low on money. I really could use some more financial assistance. And he waits and he looks at his phone and the email is now a response with, son, I'm so glad things are going well. Keep up the good work. Everything you need is in the book. Well, by now, the son is really annoyed. I mean, he loves his dad and all, but he's looking at the money that was deposited, and it's really, really shrinking to the point that it's only a couple of dollars left. So he sends an email, all caps, Dad, I'm broke. Please send money. And the father immediately sends back an email, Son, I love you. Everything you need is in the book. Well, by this point, he has had it. He loves his dad, but he's so frustrated, he just looks for something to throw in the dorm room. And the first thing he sees is the Holy Bible that his father had given him when he left from home. And he just is so angry, he picks it up, he throws it across the room, and immediately he says, you know what, I shouldn't have done that. No matter how angry I am, this is the word of God. So he walks over very, very repentant of what he had done, stoops down and picks up the book. When he picks up the book, there's an envelope. When he opens the envelope, he finds a gift card with a note wrapped around it that says, son, I know you're probably going to need more money. Whatever you need, use this card when you need it. And he looks at it and he says, everything I needed was in the book. Let me ask you, how many of us are just like that young man? We have everything we need in the Word of God. And yet when situations arise, the first thing we want to do is we want to call sister girl. We want to text. We want to FaceTime and say, I'm going through this, this, and this. And everything that we need, every answer that we need to every situation is right here in the book. I have to wonder when I look at television, and I think that's one reason that I like Turner Classic movies so much is it doesn't have commercials. Because I get sick 
to watch a commercial. Are you awake? Take this. Are you sleeping? Take this. Are you hungry? Take this. Do you have a headache? Take this. Do you have problems walking? Take this. Do you want to sit down? Take this. Do you want to stand up? Take this. Do you want to lay down? Take this. Whatever it is that you think you go into in the moment, here is a pill. Then it'll say, by the way, here are all the side effects. All you have is a runny nose, but by the time you take your medicine, that the time you can take, you got a runny nose, a headache, high blood pressure, heart problems, you got things you never had before, all because you sat around and started looking at all these instead of looking in the book. When I look at the scripture, and I'm so grateful to the Holy Spirit because he will just show you things that you didn't even see before. The first thing that jumped out at me was Simon Peter. Y'all know that Simon Peter was the, Peter was the name that God gave to Simon. Remember, Simon was the one that whatever he felt, whatever he thought, whatever was on his mind popped out of his mouth. But Jesus loved Simon because he was the real deal. And you remember when Jesus said to him, I'm going to now rename you. Your name is now going to be Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But when I noticed that he, he opened the letter, Simon Peter, what it said to me is, when he was writing this, and by the way, it was close to the end of his life. Y'all know that Peter was a martyr. Some people said that he was crucified upside down. That, that's tradition. But however he was killed, this is a when he was writing this, it was before the time of his death. And I wonder whether he wrote Simon Peter because he wanted us to understand there is always that war going on between the flesh that would be Simon and the spirit that would be Peter. Kind of letting us know, don't think that there's something wrong with you if you want to do the right thing, but there's something pulling you to doing the wrong thing. Maybe he wrote it that way to assure us that, listen, in the time of testing, you stand firm. In the time of testing, you, the Simon may want to rise up, but it's Peter that will stand firm. It's Peter that will look and say, wait a minute, I'm marching toward the gates of hell. They are not going to stand in the way of God's purpose. I know that gates are not animated unless you watch a movie. Gates are going to move and when the church of the living God is on fire for the Lord as we are supposed to be, then no power in hell going to stand up against the people of God. So then it looks and says a servant and an apostle and it also shows me that that word servant is a bond servant. That means it was more important to Peter to belong to God than it was in his where he was from an apostolic position. You know there's some folks in church they're so busy wanting to have the title that they forget titles don't mean a thing if you don't have salvation before it. Titles don't mean a thing if you're in church and you've got this long list of things that are assigned to you, but when you pull everything away and Jesus says, do I know you? Are you saved? Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? If the answer is no, it is not, then your titles mean nothing. Then when you look and says to them that have obtained like precious faith, that word precious means costly. It means everything because it cost Jesus everything, though it cost us nothing. See, when we have to look, and we are in the fourth Sunday of Lent, it is a good time for us to get a glimpse into what it means to be saved. It's a time for us to get a glimpse and to celebrate the work that Jesus did on the cross on our behalf. But it's also a time for us to understand when Peter wrote this letter, he was writing it because he wanted to uh, warn believers about false teaching and about falling into bad practices, to following into harmful influences. You say, well, how does that pertain to today? Have you checked out the news lately? Have you noticed how people are calling the right things wrong and the wrong things right? Have you noticed that when God sets his word down, when it doesn't match what man wants, man will come up with some justification as to what it means. When God's word tells us to go right, that's exactly what it means. He doesn't mean, well, I want you to go right unless it's a cloudy day and you 
don't feel like going right, then you can go ahead and go left. When he says right, he means right. When he says straight ahead, he means straight ahead. When he says behind, he means behind. God's word says exactly what it means. But the problem is, in the household of faith, yes, in the household of faith, there are some places that would rather give you cotton Christian Christianity. You know that cotton candy Christianity? You know the one that says, oh, it's so sweet, tastes so good, sounds so good. I don't have to tell you about hell because after all, hell is whatever you deem it to be. They don't want to hurt anybody's feelings because they want to make sure that when the chitlin buckets get put out there, that it is overflowing with cash. They're not concerned about the state of your soul. They're not concerned that your soul prospers. What they're concerned about is that they prosper. What they're concerned about is that you show up Sunday after Sunday, not to get fed the word of God, but to make sure you're keeping up their lifestyle, to make sure that they got the latest BMW, latest Mercedes, latest whatever it is you want to have. They're not concerned about you, but when you look at the word of God and you stick to what God's word says, then you find that you start to know God. You find you start to grow in God. You find that you start to prosper in ways you can never take to the bank. When things happen in your life, if you turn around and you got a big old bank account, but you are empty in your soul's existence, I dare say you will trade all the money in the bank for some peace. And peace is what you get when you go with God. So I looked at this. And I noticed in verse 2 when it says grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. See that grace, that grace is favor. That grace is mercy. That grace is such a beautiful thing. And it's the power and the grace that God gives us. And notice I say give because grace is a gift. Grace you cannot buy it. You can't order it on Amazon. Nothing you can do to obtain grace. It comes from God, and you got to belong to Jesus in order to have that grace. And when he says that peace, in times like these, don't you need some peace? In times like these, when the banks, well, some of the banks, start to go under, parenthetically, let me tell you something. When you look at that banking situation, and you say, well, that's just a Silicon Valley Bank or Credit Suisse or uh, the other bank that went under. Understand, when you hear them talking about let the regional banks fail and let the national banks, let the bigger banks take over, I hope you're attending Minister Chance's class. Because when you look at the book of Revelation and you find the part that says you won't be able to buy or sell unless you have the mark of the beast. When you look in today's world, that's what's being set up right now. You see, if I have cash, you can't stop me from spending it. But if all of my transactions are electronic, if I want to give money to a Christian cause and the government has decided that Christianity is a waste, they can shut down the giving that I want to do. If I want to spend money and everything is electronically based, they can stop the transaction. What am I telling you? We need to be on alert. We need to understand what time it is. We need to not be so concerned about what we wear to church, what we drive to church, any of that stuff. We need to make sure we are in church. We need to make sure the church is in us. And we need to make sure that we tell everybody what's about to go down. Because I'm telling you now, the word of God is not like that Nostradamus mess. You know how the Nostradamus, after something has occurred, they'll turn around and twist it and go, yeah, that's what he said. If you look at this clock train and move it over here and over there and twist this all around, that's what he meant. The word of God is plain. He's like, there is going to come a time and this is going to happen and God will tell us it's going to happen way before it happens. And when we see it, you don't have to twist into a pretzel, you can just read the word and that's what it says. So when you look in at all these banks, don't think it doesn't pertain to you. It pertains to all of us who are believers because it's letting us know God is allowing things to be set up. He is tuning up the trumpet and any day now that trumpet is going to sound 
And we better know whose side we are on. We better make our calling and election sure. And that's exactly what Peter is saying to the believers. He wrote the first letter in 1 Peter to encourage the believers who were facing violence. Um, uh, what do you call it? There was a lot of attacks going on against believers. Young people, I want you to kind of understand this. I'm looking for words that are breaking down. Bottom line is if you believed in Christ, you were going to get jacked up. But here in 2 Peter, he's warning, hey, believers, don't y'all fall for the okie doke Don't you be so caught up in being entertained that you miss the power that's in the blood. Don't you listen to folk telling you that Jesus has already come. He has not yet come. Don't you listen to people telling you that boys can be girls and girls can be boys. Don't you listen to folks telling you that gender is fluid. Don't you listen to folks telling you that you don't have to be in church. It's okay to be a spiritual. Don't you listen when the enemy is trying to separate you out from a body of believers because God wants us to be together. That's one thing that is so awesome about prayer meeting. When you are actually as one, lifting up the prayers to God as the Holy Spirit places on your heart, and then you begin to stand up and testify to the goodness of God. You know what that says? It says to somebody on the left who is going through, somebody on the right has made it through. It encourages you. It lets you know that there is an end to whatever you're going through. It lets you know that God is able to do anything above exceedingly whatever it is you can think or ask. It lets you know in real form, here's somebody else that didn't know how to want to make it through. Here's somebody else that didn't know what was going to happen the next day. But here's somebody else that stands up and said, I put my trust in Jesus. Here's somebody that said, I was sick and now I'm well. I called on the Holy Rapha and he healed my body. Here's somebody who said, I didn't know how I was going to make it, how I was going to make my bills be able to be paid, how I was going to make ends meet. But I called on your Holy Tyra and he made a way when there is no way. I was going through on the job. Every time I turned around, there was no peace. But I called on the Holy Shalom and now I have peace that passes all understanding. See, when the Word of God talks to you, all we have to do is do what it says. So when you look at this and you see that knowledge, that knowledge boils down to one thing. You got to experience God for yourself. You see, I can sit there as a child and I can listen to my parents talk about what God has done. I can listen to my grandparents talk about what God has done. I can go down the roll call. I can come to church and listen to the old sisters talk about the goodness of God. I can listen to all the old deacons talk about how good God been. I can do all of that. But until I got to know God for myself, until it was late in the midnight hour, until I got down on my knees and said, Lord, I don't understand this. I don't understand what's going on. And then when the Holy Spirit speaks to you and say, I don't expect you to understand. I just want you to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I want you to understand that whatever you're going through, that the Egyptians you see today, you shall see them again no more forever. I want you to understand when I bring you from this point over to this point, I want you to be able to stand and tell your brothers and sisters that no night can be so dark, but the light of the living God won't shine in this situation. I want you to tell your brothers and sisters if they're going through some situation, let them know our God just talk to him. Just walk with him. Just let him just go ahead and take control of the situation. Everything we need is in the book. Talk to God. Pray to God. Listen to God. No matter your situation, our God is able. Aren't you glad that everything that we need is in the book? All over the church will stand. Here's the thing. It's in the book. But if you don't study the word, if all you do is have a good looking Bible that's on your coffee table, 
Have a good looking Bible that's in the back of your car. Have a good looking Bible in every room of your house and you're not cracking it once. It's not going to be who you are thin. You've got to know God. You've got to experience God. And that experience comes from being like this with God. What does that mean? That means when you say, look, I'm a sinner. And I need to be saved. You see, uh, an unbeliever doesn't understand what salvation really means. But even an unbeliever, when they feel that tug, when they feel something's not right, the Holy Spirit will prompt them. And when they come forth and say, I know my life is a mess right now. I cannot deal with this anymore. I have drank everything. I shot up everything. I've done everything I could. And after my hangover, after my headache, I find I'm still dealing with the same situation. And God is saying, why don't you come to know me? Why don't you give your life to me? Let me handle this. I'm able to take care of all your situation. All I want you to do is give me your heart. All I want you to do is trust me. And if you don't know Jesus in the forgiveness of your sins this morning, whether you're in the sanctuary or Facebook or YouTube, wherever you are on the conference line, wherever you're hearing the word, if you're getting the sense that it's time to make a change, you can't change a thing. Only God can make a change. Give him your heart today and know you can have peace, you can have grace multiplied to you. Is there one this morning? Is there one? If you say, well, you know, I'm already saved. I've been saved for decades, but I've been backsliding. I got so used to, in the midst of the pandemic, just being in bed and checking out different church services. But now I need to connect with a church family. I need to have some folk that care about me. I need to be able to know that when I call on the Lord, there's going to be some folk around me going, we are praying with you. If that's you this morning, won't you come? Won't you come? Won't you come? The doors of the church are never closed. So after the service, if you say, you know, I was a little late coming forward and I want to give my life to Jesus, you can go ahead and let the ministers know, let the deacons know. Call us on the phone. We will pray with you and pray for you so that you know that eternal life will be yours. And most importantly, that all the situations that you could ever face on this side of the door are already handled because it's in the book. Our hearts and minds settled. Let us prepare to leave this place. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Father, for bringing your people together. We thank you, Lord, that everything we need is in the book, and all we have to do is rely on you, trust on you, talk to you, and walk with you. And it is now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, to permit you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, be glory, honor, dominion, and power 